I think it's safe to say that over the past couple of months, our lives have been turned upside down. Office jobs became virtual employment. Schooling, rather than going to school in the classroom, virtual classrooms. No graduation marches, even uncertainty on what school will look like in the fall. We've heard over and over again words that we seldom ever heard or even experienced in our lifetime. The words like quarantine or stay-at-home orders. No elective surgeries. Restaurants closed. Businesses closed. Employees furloughed. People losing their jobs. Wondering if they'll ever get them back. There have been daily changes in our life almost like every day presented something new. And what I want to do over the next couple of weeks is I want to deal with how do we live, not just in this type of situation, but how does God expect us to live every today? And then how does God expect us to face every tomorrow? I call your attention to the very first sermon that Jesus ever preached. In Matthew chapter 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And what I'm going to do is today I'm going to talk about how does the Lord expect us to live today? And then next week we'll deal with how does the Lord expect us to live our tomorrows? You know, someone said life is like a dollar bill. You can spend it any way you want, but you can only spend it one time. I put in your notes and I begin there with two ways you can spend today. Two ways you can spend every today. Number one, you can waste it. You can waste it. Or number two, you can invest it. Imagine if you could go back even to when you woke up this morning. And you were to be faced with a question Or should I say you could pose a question to the Lord? And I put in your notes, if you could ask the Lord, how can I make today count? What do you think he'd say? Let me give you the answer. Three words. First things first. That's how the Lord would tell us. If this morning when we were awakened, if we asked the Lord, Lord, How can I best spend today? Here would be his answer. First things first. Look at verse 33 again. Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now, I know that sounds simplistic, but if beginning today you were were to consciously, consistently, constantly, continuously, put first things first, not only would it absolutely begin to transform your life, but it would make today count. The Lord gives us three things in this one verse, three things that we need to understand and we need to apply to every today of our life. Each day, this is how our day ought to be spent. Number one, first thing, pursue the right priorities. Regardless of what happens, regardless if everything is going well, regardless of the coronavirus, regardless of the loss of employment, regardless of anything good, bad, or indifferent that happens to our life, the very first thing the Lord wants us to do is to pursue the right priorities. I mean, the reason is that everything rises and falls right here. 
You don't have to pray about what the number one priority ought to be. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to look for it. Because Jesus already told us, seek first the kingdom of God. Now, I put in your notes, the word seek means to actively pursue. Actively pursue. It's in the present tense, which means continually. Every day of our life, not just for one day, but every day of our life, we are to seek first the kingdom of God. Now, how do you do that? Let me give you two things right here on how you do it. Number one, pursue the Lord. Every day, each day, we're to pursue the Lord. You see, in order to seek the kingdom, you must first seek the king of the kingdom. Because you can't have a kingdom without a king. <clears throat> you know, I can tell you how much of the Lord you have. And that is, you have as much of the Lord as you want. Now, I put in your notes, God doesn't have any favorites. He doesn't. He doesn't have any favorites, but he does have intimates. The book of James chapter 4 and verse 8 says, James said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. God promised back in the book of Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse number 13. God said, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You see, it's not enough to seek the Lord. We have to seek him first. Seek first the kingdom of God. I put something in your notes and I posed you a question and the question is this. Which of these best describes you? And I put three things. Which of these best describes you this morning? Or whenever you're listening to this or watching this message. Number one, Jesus has a place in my life. Is that what best describes you, that Jesus has a place in your life? Or number two, Jesus has prominence in your life. Prominence. Or number three, Jesus has preeminence in your life. Now, you know what I would encourage you to do? Is sometime by yourself in your aloneness, I would encourage you to soberly look at your life and say, which of these truly best describes me? And then I want to give you an exercise. Circle the one that best describes you. You see, Jesus wants the first moments of every day. He wants the first moment, or should I say, the first day of every week. He wants to be first. He's not interested in being a runner-up in our life. He's not interested in being vice president. He doesn't want to be a, a second in command. He wants to be, listen, he wants to be king on the throne of your life. He doesn't want to be a co-partner. He wants to literally be the king that sits on the throne of your life. So how do you set and pursue the right priorities? You pursue the Lord. Secondly, pursue his rule. You see, the kingdom of God ought to be the obsession and obsession in our life. I put in your notes, the word kingdom literally means rule. A kingdom is a place where the, where the king rules. And to seek the kingdom of God is to seek his rule and his reign in our lives. Now, I put in your notes three things you will automatically seek. 
If you seek the Lord first, if you put Him as the top priority in your life each day, there are three things you're going to automatically seek. Number one, God's glory. Each part and parcel of your life, each minute and moment of your time, each ounce and pound of your strength and each muscle and fiber of your body ought to be given over to the glory of God. Your work, your business, your employment, your education, your home, your parenting, your schooling, your time alone with God, your study of God's word ought to be done for God's glory. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. All to the glory of God. You see, that's what, a, that's what a loyal subject wants to do for the king. Whatever the king wants, there's no higher calling in a loyal subject than to find out. And should I say there's no, there's no higher calling in your life or my life than to find out what God wants and then do it. Each morning, I want to challenge you to begin your day the way the Apostle Paul did when he asked in Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, Lord, what do you want me to do? Can you imagine what your life would be like if every day when you got up, you genuinely asked the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? Do you think for a moment that he'd say, well, check back with me at noon? No, because as soon as you begin your day that way, God begins to afresh and anew every day, extend you the grace, extend you everything that you need that day as he begins to prompt you what he wants out of your today. But then there's a third thing that we'll automatically seek, and that's God's control. God's control. Let's go back to that kingdom thought because you see a loyal subject desires to be controlled by the king. A loyal subject desires to be governed by the king, to be ruled by the king. It reminds me of the lady that was deathly sick and her neighbor was with her and she said, do you... Do you want to live or die? I mean, you're so bad. And she said, I just want to do whatever pleases God. And the lady, the neighbor lady said, well, what would you do if he threw it back in your lap and gave you the choice? She said, I would just refer it back to him and let him make the choice. You see, it's better to die in the will of God than to live outside of the will of God. I'll never forget the afternoon when my father, as we were standing on his front porch, and I had yet to become a Christian, and my father said, son, I'd rather see you on the other side of the world living and never be able to see you again in the will of God and then he pointed to the other side of the street in the house and said, and then to live across the street outside of the will of God. And so number one, pursue the right priorities. Seek first the kingdom of God. And that leads me to the second thing that Jesus said here. And that is he said, I want you to pursue personal purity. Look at verse 33 again. Seek first the kingdom of God, now watch this, and his righteousness. I put in your notes, not only should we be seeking God's control over us, we, sh we should seek God's character within us. 
You see, the kingdom of God is not only to be inwardly experienced, but it's to be outwardly expressed. You see, if God is ruling over you, then God's righteousness is going to be within you. That's a man's character. You know, you know what a man's character is? A man's character is simply an outward expression of what is controlling him on the inside. Now listen carefully. The reason Jesus hit this, his righteousness, is because he understood that we're never going to make a difference in this world until the world sees a difference in us. I think of Friedrich Nietzsche, a German philosopher who was really the philosophical founder of the Nazi movement in Germany. He was the first man in history to to conclude that God was dead. And he said that he came to that conclusion by looking at Christianity. And he said to Christians, if you want me to believe in your Redeemer, then you need to act a little more redeemed. That's why Jesus said, pursue personal purity. Now, what what does it mean when Jesus says, seek God's righteousness? Let me give you three things. Number one, when you seek God's righteousness, you desire it. You desire it. Earlier, when Jesus began to speak, he said in the Beatitudes in in chapter 5 of Matthew, in verse number 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see, what Jesus was saying is that we ought to, we ought to desire to do right, to be right, to live right. I mean, just as a hungry man desires food and a thirsty man desires water. I'll never forget in my first pastorate, I came to this passage of Scripture I was studying, and I came to Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And I mean like my life stood still at that moment because I realized I don't think I hunger And I don't think I thirst after righteousness. I wanted it, but I don't think I was there. And I began to pray, Lord, I hunger to be hungry. And I thirst to be thirsty. If that's where you are today, I would encourage you that you begin to say, Oh God, give me the appetite. Give me the thirst that I need. Get me to the place where I hunger to be hungry and I thirst to be thirsty. Because I will tell you this, that there is no refreshing, exhilarating state to be in than to know that you genuinely hunger and thirst after righteousness. Not only will you desire it, but secondly, you derive it. It means that you derive it. You see, we are to seek his righteousness. God's not interested in your righteousness or my righteousness. I mean, think of it this way. God is not interested in what you can do for him. He's not. He's interested in what he can do through you, what he can do through you. Paul, the Apostle Paul, after he got saved, made this one of the goals of his life when he said, I want to be found. And in Romans chapter 3 and verse 9, he said, I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, that the righteousness which is from God by faith. The righteousness which is from God by faith. If if I could say this about righteousness, it must be imputed before it can be imparted. 
In other words, before you can live it, God's got to give it. That is why Paul wrote later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What does it mean to seek his righteousness? It means you desire it, but it means you derive it. Not your righteousness, his righteousness. And then thirdly, you demonstrate it. You flesh it out. You live it. It's not something we just keep to ourselves. It's an automatic thing that you begin to live it. Because we ought to live, if I could say it this way, like kingdom subjects. We ought to live for the king. I remember what Will Rogers said. He said, we ought to live in such a way that we would not be ashamed to sell the family parrot to the town gossip. What a way to live. What a way to live. Jesus said, first of all, pursue the right priorities. Secondly, pursue personal purity. Personal purity. And then Jesus said, there is a third thing. And I want you to understand this. Expect God's provision. Look at verse 33 again. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now watch this. And all these things shall be added to you. Now the Lord says that when we seek his righteousness and we seek it first, his kingdom and his righteousness, that all these things will be added to us. I put in your notes a question, what things was the Lord referring to? Here's the answer. All the things people worry about. And Jesus addressed some of these things. Number one, people worry about money. That's why in verse 19, Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. People worry about money. Secondly, people worry about food. Therefore, I say unto you in verse 25, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? People worry about money. They worry about food. People, people worry about the length of life. Jesus said in verse 27, Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? And then fourthly, Jesus said, People worry about clothes. Verse 28, So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the fields, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, all of these things are things that we, we need. That's why the Lord said in verse 32, For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. You see, the, the Lord promised that if we will seek him, if we'll seek his, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that all the things that we have need of, we'll have. God said, expect my provision. All the things you need, you'll have. But he didn't say that we would have all the things that we want. I, I want to take a moment here and I put it in your notes. I want to talk to parents because there are four, four lessons that parents ought to teach their children early, as early as possible. And may I say these are four lessons that all of us adults need to relearn. Here they are. Number one, 
teach your child, you don't need everything you want. You don't need everything you want. You know, I got to be honest with you, I wish I had all the money that I've spent in my lifetime on things that I wanted, but I really didn't need. You don't need everything you want. And then secondly, teach your child you don't want, or you, yeah, you don't want everything you need. I can tell you this, I never wanted I never wanted one discipline from my father. Never wanted one spanking when I was growing up. But I needed every one of them. You don't want everything you need. There are going to be things you can teach your child that that you're going to want, but you don't need it. Number three, teach them that God doesn't give us everything we want. I am... I am so glad that he doesn't. You know, I I found out in my life that one of the greatest blessings as I look back over my life are the things that that I want, but God didn't give give them to me. I think of what I came across years and years ago. It's called The Confession of an Unknown Confederate Soldier. Let me read it to you. He wrote, I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked God for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might find and feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for, but everything I hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. But there's a fourth lesson that we want to teach our children and remind ourselves of, and that is God always gives us what we need. He always gives us what we need. There were two managers of these stores that were across the street from each other, and they were incredibly competitive. And one day, a manager of one of those stores put a big sign out in front of his stores. If you want it, we have it. If you want it, we have it. And later on that day, the manager of the other store across the street came out and put a sign that says, if we don't have it, you don't need it. If we don't have it, You don't need it. Let me tell you this much. If you don't have it, it is because at this point in your life, God knows that you don't need it. I want to encourage you to begin facing every day the way Jesus outlined in verse 33. Every day. That's how we face it, regardless of what it is. Regardless if it's with a virus or it's no virus. Regardless if we're quarantined. Regardless if we have to stay at home or we're able to be back to work and get out about it. It doesn't matter how we live and how we face each day. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And before I close, I would just like to ask you, because all of this begins with knowing Jesus as your personal Savior. 
Because the very first thing we need to seek from him is our forgiveness of sin and to receive him as our personal Lord and Savior. Let me ask you a question and answer it honestly. Has there ever been a time in your life when you asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and be your Savior and your Lord? Regardless of what life is like for you now, if you never have today, this very moment, you can do it. You can do it right now. Simply say, God, I am a sinner and I admit it. And I want to thank you for sending Jesus, your son, to die on the cross for me. And this moment, I open my heart to your son. I believe that he died on the cross for my sin, that he paid the penalty for my sin, that he shed his blood, that my sins might be forgiven, that he rose from the dead. And this very moment, God, I ask Jesus to come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I trust him and only him as my Savior and as my Lord. If you just did that, if you just prayed, then God heard your prayer, he forgave you of your sin, and he brought you into his forever family. If for whatever reason you've not done it yet, then you can do it anytime. I simply urge you, don't put it off. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Thanks for spending time with us today. As the message came to a close, if you made a decision to receive Jesus into your life, would you text the word ALIVE to 614-892-7272? By sending that, you can let us know about your decision and we'll connect you with a pastor on staff. If you'd like to know more about our church, check out nwbible.org. And just a reminder, if you're on our YouTube channel, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell. It's been a privilege to worship with you. Until next time, God bless and have a great day.